Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, so today we are joined by John Kirby, NSC Coordinator for Strategic Communications. Uh, Kirby is here to share an update on Russia's activities in U Ukraine and answer a few questions. So, Kirby, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kirby. Good afternoon, everybody. So I wanted to let you know that we have information today, including from downgraded intelligence that we're able to share with you about how Russia is laying the groundwork to annex Ukrainian territory that it controls in direct violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. We are seeing ample evidence in the intelligence and in the public domain that Russia intends to try to annex additional Ukrainian territory. Russia is beginning to roll out a version of what you could call an annex annexation playbook, very similar to the one we saw in 2014. Already, Russia is installing illegitimate proxy officials in the areas of Ukraine that are under its control. And we know their next moves. First, these proxy officials will arrange sham referenda on joining Russia. Then, Russia will use those sham referenda as a basis to try to claim annexation of sovereign Ukrainian territory. The Russian government is reviewing detailed plans to purportedly annex a number of regions in Ukraine, including Kherson, Zaporizhia, all of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Russia is attempting to set the conditions on the ground by seeking to establish branches of Russian banks to establish the ruble as the default currency in these areas and to sabotage civilian internet access. Russia's security services continue to target Ukrainians that they believe to be associated with resistance activities. In Kherson, for example, Russia is taking control of broadcasting towers, establishing loyalist security forces, replacing telecommunications infrastructure, forcing residents to apply for Russian citizenship, and issuing Russian passports. Russia is also installing loyalists in areas of Ukraine that it controls, including a man named Sergei Yeliseyev, a former Russian intelligence officer who has been put in charge of Kherson. Figures like Yeliseyev are Russian bureaucrats with absolutely no connection to Ukraine. No connection. The Kremlin has not disclosed a timeline for the referenda, but Russian proxies in these territories claim they will take place later this year, possibly in conjunction with Russia's September regional elections. So what are the implications? At the start of the year, Russia told the world that it was not planning to invade Ukraine, and now we're expected to believe that they're not going to plan to annex Ukrainian territory. Annexation by force would be a gross violation of the UN Charter, and we will not allow it to go unchallenged or unpunished. We will continue to provide Ukraine with historic levels of security assistance. Later this week, the administration will announce the next presidential drawdown package of weapons and equipment for Ukraine. It will be the 16th such drawdown to support Ukraine since the president took office. That package will include more HIMARS, that's highly mobile advanced rocket systems, uh, which the Ukrainians have been using very effectively to make a difference on the battlefield. And it will also include some additional rounds of multiple lock, launch rocket systems um, and artillery ammunition. We're also going to continue to expose Russian plans so the world knows that any purported annexation is premeditated, illegal, and illegitimate. And we are sanctioning the Russian-installed puppets and proxies in areas of Ukraine that are under Russian control. For example, just last month, we sanctioned the illegitimate Russian-installed mayor of Melitopol, as well as the chairperson and deputy chairpersons of the so-called government of the DNR. So what next? If Russia nevertheless proceeds with their annexation plans, we are going to respond swiftly and severely, and in lockstep with our allies and partners. Russia will face additional sanctions and become even more of a global pariah than it is now. We will never recognize any purportedly annexed territory as belonging to Russia. We will support accountability efforts for forced deportations, prosecutions of oppositionists, and other gross human rights abuses carried out by Russia. And we would remind Mr. Putin that over time, it may prove unable to hold this territory. It's not a given. The Ukrainian, terror the Ukrainian military will work to retake that territory, and the Ukrainian people will resist Russian control and seek to drive Russia out, as they have been doing the last five months. Russia already made a grave mistake with its invasion. It's achieved none of their strategic objectives. When they invaded Ukraine, only four of the 192 other members of the UN took Moscow's side. 
So the international community, we're convinced, will continue to stand up for state sovereignty. Any sham efforts to legitimize an illegal land grab will only make things worse for Russia. And we're going to help make sure of that. And one other item, before I start taking some questions today, we announced a series of actions the Biden-Harris administration has taken to expand the toolkit that the U.S. government uses to deter and disrupt hostage takings and wrongful detentions. I think you may have seen this out there. It'll help bring Americans home. This morning, the President signed an executive order that provides expanded tools to help bring our citizens home. Specifically, it authorizes agencies to impose costs and consequences, including financial sanctions and visa bans on governments and non-state actors and those that provide them with the material support who are involved in hostage takings or wrongful detentions. The State Department is also introducing a new risk indicator to their travel advisories to inform U.S. citizens about the risk of wrongful detention by a foreign government in six countries that have regularly engaged in this practice. This new indicator joins the existing K indicator, so it's a D indicator, the new one, uh, the K indicator that, in that covers the risk of kidnapping and hostage taking by non-state actors, as well as a range of other existing risk indicators for a country. These actions demonstrate President Biden's unwavering commitment to bringing home U.S. nationals held hostage and wrongfully detained, and to try to help prevent more Americans and their families from having to go through this kind of terrible ordeal. So with that, I'll take questions. Good. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, given what you've said about uh, Russians and Russia's annexation plans, what is the U.S. assessment of President Putin's visit to Iran and why he was willing to take such an unusual and risky trip at this time to meet with the Supreme Leader? Well, I'll let Mr. Putin speak for why he decided to go at this particular time, but I would say three things about this trip. One, it shows the degree to which Mr. Putin and Russia are increasingly isolated. Now they have to turn to Iran for help. Two, it shows the degree to which his own defense industrial base is having a hard time keeping up with his unprovoked war in Ukraine. We already know that in re respect to precision-guided munitions and advanced systems, like tanks, even aircraft, he's having trouble, particularly with the microelectronics because of the sanctions and the export controls. And we already know that even without that, his defense industrial base is challenged because of the rate uh, of operation, the pace of operations in, in Ukraine. Uh, and then the third thing I think this indicates is, is the degree to which he has absolutely no intention of, 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 of stopping the war and sitting down in good faith in a negotiated settlement with Mr. Zelensky. He has every intention, quite the contrary, because now he wants to go buy several hundred UAVs to continue to prosecute this illegal war and to continue to kill Ukrainians. Oh, and, and what does the U.S. know about the meeting that uh, President Putin had in Iran with uh, Turkish leader Erdogan and what it could mean for reinstating Ukrainian grain exports? I'll let them speak to their meetings. Um, um, I, I don't know what was on the agenda for, for that. Um, we are mindful of the talks that have been ongoing between Turkey, Russia, and Ukraine about grain exports. And we hope for progress in those talks, but we're clear-eyed about it. Uh, the, we're clear-eyed about Russia's ambitions here. We're clear-eyed about the fact that there's a, basically a blockade in the Black Sea. So while we certainly welcome Mr. Erdogan's leadership in here, and the President has, has thanked him for that leadership, but we're trying to come up with a negotiated solution here to get the grain out. It, it's unfortunate that he even has to have those talks because there's a blockade that Russia could stop today. They could take their ships out of the Black Sea, they could let that grain go um, and, uh, and alleviate a lot of food security problems, not just in Europe, but in the Middle East, in Africa, or elsewhere around the world. So again, um, we're hopeful that there can be some sort of arrangement to get that grain out of there. Um, but uh, but we're, not, we're not looking at it through rose-colored glasses in terms of the uh, uh, the success that they'll ultimately be able to achieve. The only thing I'd add to that is it's good to see Ukraine at the table in, in these discussions, and that, that's as it should be. Ukraine absolutely uh, has to be part of whatever solution is, is solved, and their economy can't suffer any more than it already has as a result of Russian blockade activity. Let's go back. Jenny, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, thank Jenny, you. Let me get my pen. I dropped it. <laughs> 
Because often when you ask me questions, yeah. I have to write them down. Okay. Go ahead. Don't be nervous. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I am always nervous when you're a poet. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I have two questions on uh, one Ukraine and one Russia. The Ukraine recently announced that uh, diplomatic surveillance with North Korea. And meanwhile, uh, Russia announced that it would send in North Korean workers to rebuild Donbass in Ukraine. What is your comment? Or is it a, a violation of the UN Security Council sanctions? I'm, uh, I'm not expert enough on sanctions to know whether these actions are violations of resolutions. Um, but again, it just shows the degree to which Mr. Putin remains isolated. Now he's got to turn to North Korea, you know, and he's got to turn to Iran here, uh, rather than just doing the right thing to begin with and ending the war. Um, um, and <laughs> eventually there's going to be reconstruction of Ukraine. But that's going to be for the Ukrainians to decide, Janie. Not the Russians, not the North Koreans, not anybody else, but President Zelensky and the, and the Ukrainian people they're going to get to decide uh, how they uh, reconstruct their country after this war. And obviously, uh, and you've heard the president talk about this, we're going, to, we're going to be there to support him through that process. The goal right now, and we can't forget what it is right now, and as I, well, I mentioned it in my opening statement, is to continue to help Ukraine defend itself against this aggression inside their country, making sure that Mr. Zelensky and the Ukrainian armed forces have what they need uh, to continue to fight back and to and to reclaim the, their sovereignty. That's what matters right now. Thank you, Kareem. Um, I'd like to ask you, sir, a question about some of the comments that the president made when he was in Spain last month. But before that, uh, rewinding to some of your, your statements moments ago, um, you said that Russia over time may prove unable to hold the territory that they're annexing. I'm wondering, what does that mean in terms of the U.S. commitment to Ukraine? Are, are, are we talking about you know, backing some sort of military operation for the Ukrainians to take back uh, territory that was taken from them? Or was that a more general statement about diplomatic pressure? There's no change to uh, our policy with respect to helping Ukraine defend itself. Um, now, we help provide them the training that they need in some of these advanced systems and the systems themselves. And I would remind you that it's not just the United States, some 50 other countries. In fact, uh, Secretary Austin is going to be holding yet another iteration of the Ukraine, Ukraine contact group this week. And I suspect you'll see additional international contributions to Ukrainian security assistance. And we give that material to them. We give them the training if they need it. Mr. Zelensky and his chain of command, they determine how they're going to use it. Um, and we have seen over the last, it's hard to believe, five months, but five months, where the Ukrainians, sometimes all in the same day, will, uh, will, will be on the defensive in some areas and on the offensive in others. And we have seen, just in the last week or two, uh, both of that, depending on where you're at. Uh, the Ukrainians are certainly, they have a right not only to defend themselves, but they absolutely have a right to go on the counteroffensive inside their own country against Russian forces. Now, where and when they do that, and how they do that, and what systems they use, that's for them to decide. Our job, again, is to make sure they've got the tools and the training to be able to, go, to, to uh, defend them. question. Um, President Biden announced last month that he was going to be sending uh, two more destroyers to Rota, Spain. I think the number is going from four to six. That's right. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, why is the president sending these warships to the Mediterranean uh, to defend the Spanish coast there. I mean, this is a country that spends about 1% of its GDP on total defense, uh, when there seems to be an increasingly uh, serious threat in the Indo-Pacific from China. I mean, shouldn't Spain step up? Shouldn't the Italians or French, you know, patrol their own waters so that we can have a free hand on the other side of the world? This is one of the very few questions I'll probably ever get that are right down my lane. <laughs> I knew you were coming today. I, uh, you know, and I served as a young officer in the Med um, uh, on a couple of different deployments. I mean, uh, so, so a home port is just where the ship stays. Right. It doesn't mean that the, that the, the ship is just, just there to sail in the, in the waters off of, off of Spain. And so the four destroyers that we have uh, in the Mediterranean right now 
they patrol the Mediterranean. And frankly, uh, there are times when they'll patrol into the North Atlantic. It's just, just having them in Spain is what we call forward deployed. It's like we have, you know, we have an aircraft carrier and warships in Japan uh, forward deployed. We have uh, ships forward deployed into the Middle East in, in, uh, based in Bahrain. It's just a place to, it, it shortens the time and distance to get them on station where they ne might need to be. And it's this decision by the president to add two destroyers to the four that are there, I think is indicative of what the president has said many times. The s security environment in Europe is different now. It has changed. Not is changing, not will change, has changed. And we need to meet that. Uh, this is just one of many moves uh, and that the president spoke to uh, in Madrid and at the G7 uh, that were taken to improve our military posture on NATO's eastern flank. And some of those moves will be permanent in addition to the two ships. And it's going to take a little while for them to get there, to be permanently home base there. So it's not going to happen tomorrow. But we're going to put a headquarters forward command element in Poland, first time ever. Uh, we're going to make more regular the, the uh, more routine, I should say, the rotational deployments of, of, of Army land forces uh, throughout the eastern flank as well. So it's all part and parcel of a larger effort by the United States to make sure that we are m able to meet our Article 5 commitment to our NATO allies, particularly uh, on the eastern flank. So we're not emphasizing one theater at the expense of another? Well, the, you, you have to do both. Um, and uh, I'm glad you followed up on that. I mean, uh, we already have 60 percent of the United States Navy either in or based in the, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there's already a robust uh, military capability uh, in that part of the world, and, and there's n we have no uh, intention whatsoever uh, of decreasing that focus and that energy there. You've heard Secretary Austin talk about China being the pacing challenge for the United States military, and that's exactly uh, how they're treating it. Take a look at the budget that we just submitted uh, for 23, and you'll see chapter and verse how the United States military uh, is really trying to make sure they're investing in the kinds of capabilities that we're going to need in the Indo-Pacific to face that pacing challenge. Look, the United States military is a global, a global power, uh, and you have to be focused uh, on uh, all kinds of different regions and face all kinds of different threats. The president was just in the Middle East because that, too, is an important uh, area for our national security interests. We can do, we can do more than one. Um, quick question, uh, just to sort of follow up on what you said uh, about U.S. responding to any sort of annexation attempts. What kind of options are available to the U.S. Uh, if you were to respond? Yeah, I talked about that a little bit in the in the uh, in, in the we we certainly uh, uh, have additional sanctions. We could uh, we could employ we could strengthen the ones that are already in place. Uh, we can uh, further try to uh, to make it harder, squeeze Mr. Putin's ability to uh, to to wage. War, uh, waging war is an expensive business. He now, uh, his, he's facing inflation of up to, thanks to all the international pressure, he's already facing inflation of up to 20 percent. Um, uh, his, uh, uh, his imports have fallen by 40 percent. Um, the uh, Russian stock market fell by about 30 percent recently. I mean, th this has not been without costs, and we can we can raise those costs on him. Are you expecting to do any of that in the next uh, few? Months? I don't have anything to announce today. We wanted to make it clear today what we're seeing, uh, and we've already, as as I said in my opening statement, started to ex uh, to um, to sanction some of these so-called uh, officials. Um, so I don't have any new. Uh, announcements to make today, uh, but we just wanted to make very plain for the American people what we're seeing and make it very plain to Mr. Putin that nobody's fooled by it. We know he's just dusting off the old playbook from 2014, um, and we're going to be watching this closely. Last point, and it's important. I know I, I, I say it all the time, but it's not just the United States. Uh, the international community is wise to this as well, uh, and we fully expect that our allies and partners will participate in any additional pressure put on Mr. Putin. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Um, I wonder if we could change topics a bit here. You've long talked about how uh, climate change is a national security issue uh, for the country. I'm wondering if you uh, view this as a national emergency, and if you believe that executive actions uh, that will be announced uh, are enough of a message to send to the world that the U.S. is indeed serious about climate change. I don't have. I'm not going to get ahead of any announcements. Um, uh, on specific um, actions with respect to, to climate. But let me take a step back. I mean, the, the, the Pentagon has noted, um, not just in this administration, but even the previous one, that 
climate change is a national security uh, issue. Um, geez, Jeff, I mean, not only does it affect our infrastructure, and you're already starting to see military bases like Norfolk Naval Base having to invest millions of dollars uh, to try to improve their infrastructure because of rising sea levels. Um, so it has an impact on our infrastructure. It has an impact on our readiness because uh, you, and you're seeing it now, even in the wildfires, uh, where, where so many National Guardsmen are being called out, and, and, and uh, God love them for that, but they're, those are important tasks and missions, but it takes away from other tasks and missions when it comes to defending the United States. Um, so there's, a, there's an impact on our own readiness just because our, our troops, uh, our sailors, our Marines, our airmen, our Coast Guardsmen are being called out for to respond to natural disasters, which are getting worse because of climate change. And then lastly, it's a driver of actual missions because uh, climate change uh, creates uh, instability, which creates insecurity in some places, and you can end up, the, the, the fighting in Syria uh, started really as a result of a drought. Um, and so there's, uh, there's a, it, it can actually drive military missions and, and, and force the military to become involved in places and at times uh, where they wouldn't have had, had, had to otherwise. So again, I don't want to get out of the president or any, um, any decisions he may or may not make, but, uh, but the president believes it, that this is uh, a, a very important issue for our own national security, and, and we're going we're gonna to treat it that way. Uh, back to Iran and Russia, and if I may, one a quick one on the executive order from today. Uh, Jake Sullivan had said last week that Iran was preparing to train Russian forces to use armed drones in Ukraine starting this month. Does the U.S. have an indication that those training sessions have started or that Iran has actually given those drones to Russia? We don't have any indications that the, that the sale has actually occurred. Um, and so, therefore, we, we wouldn't have any indications that the, there's been the training done on them. And I don't want us to get lost in the details here. I mean, I know it's important. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't have talked about it if, it if it wasn't. But it is an indication of how much more desperate Mr. Putin is becoming in terms of his own defense industrial base and the degree to which he wants to continue to prosecute this war. Now, a lot of it's going to depend on how many does he buy, what kind of capabilities they have. Uh, but the Iranians have a domestic production capability of drones, and those drones have lethal capabilities. We've seen that for ourselves uh, in the attacks that they have, uh, they have uh, perpetrated uh, in Iraq and in Syria against our own troops and against our own facilities there. Um, so we're watching this closely, and we're taking it seriously. And on the executive order from today, how quickly might we see sanctions on people or countries that the U.S. considers uh, responsible for detaining Americans wrongfully right now? And how might this impact or play into the cases of Brittany Griner or Paul Wheeler? I don't want to get ahead of any decision space here. That, that's not my role today. Um, uh, these are additional tools that the CEO gives us, including the ability uh, to, to levy a, additional sanctions. So um, again, I'm not going to preview anything or get ahead. Um, last thing I'd say on this is that the president remains laser focused on, on these cases and in constant touch with his national security team and with our uh, special presidential envoy for hostage affairs on all these cases, including, of course, Mr. Whalen and, and, uh, and Mrs. Greiner. Thank you, Kareem. Um, on the Iran nuclear deal talks, John, um, I just wanted to get uh, your view on this. Wendy Sherman said last week it's in Iran's deal, or best interest to make a deal. Uh, they would get sanctions relief, they would improve their economy and sell their oil again, and the world needs their oil so they could get a good price for it. So I'm asking, is the White House viewing sanctions relief for Iran as a way to bring down gas prices? The administration is looking uh, at uh, a return to the JCPOA, the Iran deal, to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. That's the goal. And you heard the president talk about this on the trip. No problem in the Middle East, none, gets easier to solve if Iran has a nuclear weapon. That's the goal of the Iran deal. Now, look, there's a deal on the table. Um, and the onus is on Iran now t to decide whether they're going to take that deal. If they take that deal, yes, sanctions relief will be a part of it, as it was before, uh, uh, before the previous administration pulled out of it. But the goal, the objective, the purpose is to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. So how should we understand her statement then? Because the president's whole strategy when he was on his Middle East tour was to counter Iran, but her language makes it seem like maybe, you know, they're not so bad if they bring down gas prices, which has been hurting the president in the polls, obviously. 
Well, look, I mean, there's obviously a, a, a tangential, potentially tangential benefit um, uh, should they sign into the deal and actually stop spinning their centrifuges uh, and come into compliance uh, and allow themselves to be back inside the most rigid inspection regime ever in an arms control agreement, uh, which would include potentially sanctions relief, which would include obviously some economic breathing space for them uh, to do things p p potentially uh, on the oil market. But again, Jackie, that's not the purpose here. The, the purpose is to, to try to prevent them from having a nuclear weapons capability. That's the goal. That's, that's what it's all about. One last question on um, this statement from Iran that they can produce a nuclear bomb if they want to, but they haven't made that decision. Uh, it comes after Biden and the Israeli Prime Minister publicly disagreed on the best way to counter Iran. You know, how concerning is it that Putin's meeting with Iran right after Iran said that they can build a bomb if they want to? Again, I'll let those leaders speak for the timing of, of, of this visit. Um, uh, what we're focused on uh, is making sure Ukraine can continue to defend itself. And obviously, it looks like, potentially, they're going to have to learn to defend themselves from these Iranian drones. Um, and as you saw on the trip in the Middle East, the president's focused on an integrated, more stable, more secure Middle East. And you can't get there. You can't have that as an outcome if Iran builds a nuclear weapon. And they're closer to it today than they were five years ago. The president understands that sense of urgency, which is why uh, he wanted his team to negotiate this deal. And now the negotiations are complete. So we're close. Iran just has to agree to accept that deal, come back into compliance. That won't solve all the problems. N not at all. Uh, it'll solve if they come back into compliance and, and, and submit to the inspections um, and a reduction uh, in their stockpiles. Uh, it'll certainly help solve the, the more urgent problem now uh, of their burgeoning nuclear capability. But it, it won't necessarily solve their uh, developing ballistic missile capability, which continues to improve. It won't necessarily solve uh, their support for terrorist networks. Uh, in the region. It won't solve the threats to maritime security in the Gulf uh, that we continue to see uh, out of Iran. Um, and uh, it potentially couldn't, you know, might, may, you know, won't solve all problems uh, in, in Yemen, although we're glad for this ceasefire. So we're still going to have to stay focused on all those other issues, which is, again, why the president's trip was so important. Thank you, Kareem. John, uh, first on the uh, Russian annex, and then if I could ask a China question. On the Russia annexation comments that you're making, can you talk a little bit more about what specifically is new in the downgraded intelligence that you brought up? I mean, the administration has been warning um, about sham elections, about referendums uh, since the spring. Kyrgyzstan has been uh, named in the past as possibly a place this could happen. So what has actually what are you seeing that is new in the last few weeks that you did not know before? I have to be somewhat careful in answering the question because we're talking about some declassified intelligence. Um, I would I would point you to some of the specificity in my open comments about uh, about some of the individuals, some of the locations, um, uh, um, and then just the modalities. I think of uh, of how the Russians plan to pursue this uh, in, in time and space. And it's really about as far as I'm able to go. Uh, but we know this is going to be a concerted effort here. Um, and um, some of it is in, it is in parallel to the incremental territorial gains that they're making. And, and some of the designs here uh, are a representation of the frustration that they haven't uh, had as much success uh, uh, in territorial gains as they've had in the past. But is this more of an incremental advancement in that in that theory of, of, of Russia trying to annex? I mean, we've just been hearing about it for a while. So I mean, I'm just trying to gauge how much how different is this than what's been going we, on for a while now. They, they this is out of the playbook, and we've seen them do it in the past. Uh, it, what what we're seeing now is a a more concerted. Um, uh, more strategic effort, and I, I think that's really about as far uh, as I can go. On, on China, China tariffs. Um, you know, I asked Karine about this yesterday, um, and talked about the the efforts of the administration, kind of address that, and, uh, resolve concerns that they have about what Trump did. Um, can you talk about uh, a little bit about where efforts to ease those tariffs is, and when we might be able to, when we might see uh, some of the things that Biden has said. 
is expected to come out of that? I don't have anything new for you today. Uh, uh, and I certainly can't add to what uh, Kareem said yesterday. Uh, the president's looking at this. Um, uh, he wants to make sure that he makes the best decisions uh, for the American people and for the American economy. And I'm certainly not going to get ahead of that. He's taking this very seriously, as he should. Yeah, we take two from the back. Yeah, Ed, yeah. and then the gentleman. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to ask you about oil in Saudi Arabia. So should we expect an announcement then from uh, on August 3rd from OPEC or Saudi Arabia um, about increasing oil production because of the president's visit? I, I'm certainly not going to speak for OPEC. Uh, they get to uh, they get to make uh, their decisions and, and speak to them. I would point you to what the president said when we were in Jeddah that uh, that the discussions on energy security. Uh, were quite constructive, um, and that, that he expects that uh, it's possible uh, that we could see some movement here in the next two to three weeks. And so, uh, so we're just going to watch that and, and, and see, how, see how it goes. I, important to remember, and I think he also reminded, that OPEC plus three has already increased by 50 percent, planned increases in July and August. That's been helpful. In addition to the one million barrels a day that the president has released from the Strategic Reserve, all that oil has helped stabilize the market, and the price still hovers around 100. Um, that's because the market likes stability, and so those additions have created that kind of uh, breathing space for the prices uh, on at the pump to, to start, just to start, uh, uh, to come down. So we'll see where it goes. The, the discussions both at the GCC and bilaterally with the Saudis, again, were very constructive when it comes to energy, and, and we'll be watching. One more on the so I noticed on the president's schedule the last two days uh, there have been no public events. Is he resting after the large international trips? Well, the president's been busy. I'll let Kareem speak to the president's schedule, uh, but the president's been quite busy. Just because you don't see uh, something necessarily on the public schedule doesn't mean that uh, there's not a lot of work going on. Thank, thank you. Um, the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee just reported out the resolution regarding the admission of Finland and Sweden to NATO, and uh, they're likely to do that before August recess. Can you speak to the importance of getting that done before the August recess? And also, is there any sort of message regarding the, I think it was 18 uh, House Republicans who last night voted against a non-binding resolution on the admission of the countries to uh, NATO? Uh, I would just tell you that uh, we obviously want to see uh, Finland and Sweden uh, brought into the alliance as soon as possible. Uh, and so we look forward to uh, congressional action that will allow that to be the case, at least from the United States perspective. As you know, every ally has to ratify. We're not the only ones. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, we believe it's in our interest and it's in the alliance's interest uh, for a session of those two countries to happen uh, as soon as possible. These are modern militaries, militaries that we know well. We exercise with them, operate with them. I myself did a long, long time ago. Um, uh, and they've got uh, incredible modern capabilities that will absolutely help uh, bolster uh, NATO's defensive capabilities uh, and contribute significantly to, uh, to, to the Article 5 commitment that we all sign into when we come into the alliance. So we're looking forward to it. We urge Congress to act as quickly as possible. Thanks. Ken, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to the family's reaction to the uh, hostage and the wrongful detention executive order. Uh, the group uh, Bring Our Families Home issued a statement saying that uh, the order is simply the White House taking executive action to direct itself to follow existing law. The group says the president should agree to take a meeting with the families. Will he do that? I don't have anything on the president's schedule specifically to speak to today. I would uh, uh, remind that uh, the whole national security team re remains uh, committed to staying in touch with these families, and we have routine uh, discussions with them, with all of them. Uh, our special presidential envoy for hostage affairs is in regular contact with them. We know that they're suffering. We know they're scared, and we know they're anxious. And we know that they want their loved ones back home, and the president wants that too. Uh, and this executive order uh, will give us some additional tools in the, in the toolbox. Is it going to solve every problem? Nope. Every case is specific. And you got to look at each one individually and figure out what the best way is forward. Sometimes turning up the heat uh, uh, publicly is the answer. Sometimes turning it down is the answer. Sometimes, uh, you know, sanctions could be useful. Sometimes not. Each one's, in, each one's individual and each one's different. Because you know what? To those families, it's individual as well. They just want their loved ones home, and the president wants that too. 
This EO is a useful extra set of tools that we'll have in our toolbox to help bring that about. Thanks. Appreciate it, everybody. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. I have a few things at the top. Uh, speaking of uh, climate change, so we are closely <laughs> monitoring extreme heat conditions uh, impacting much of Europe, as well as the extreme heat impacting the more than 100 million Americans who are struggling with extreme heat conditions here at home just this week alone. The impacts of extreme weather are intensifying across the globe, including here in the United States. No one is immune from climate change. It's why the president has been rallying the world to take the decisive action needed in this decade to tackle the climate change, uh, the climate crisis. It's also why the president is committed to taking aggressive action to tackle climate change and made clear if the Senate won't act, he will. In fact, as many, you, as many of you have seen already today, the president will travel to Somerset, Massachusetts tomorrow. While there, he will visit the future site of manufacturing plant located at a former coal-fired power plant that will produce uh, transmission cables for Massachusetts' booming offshore wind industry. The president will underscore the historic clean energy investments his bipartisan infrastructure law will make in Massachusetts and announce additional actions he will take to tackle the climate crisis and secure a clean energy future. The president ran on fighting the unprecedented economic and national security threat of climate change, and he has, take, he has been taking decisive action to do so since taking office. Tomorrow's action will be a continuation of that work. And I have two things, because I know folks uh, in the room asked this question, two different questions yesterday, and I said I would get back to them. I think, Eugene, you had a question about ACLU. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security is committed to complying with the law and respects the privacy and civil liberties of individuals. Uh, DHS employs various forms of technology to undertake the, its mission. This includes using tools uh, to better investigate threats to infrastructure traffickers of deadly opioids on the dark web and to identify those involved in cross-border uh, transnational criminal organizations and terrorist activities. And again, as I said to you yesterday, for further information, I would point you to DHS. And I just have one more for uh, the Ma uh, Marburg virus disease in Ghana. I have an uh, answer, I came back with an answer for you. I think this is from Simon. Uh, Ghana reported two fatal cases of suspected hemorr hemorrhagic fever in the Ashanti region of Ghana in early July, which tested positive for Marburg virus disease almost two weeks after presentation. These were the first cases over reported from the country. U.S. agencies at our embassy in Accra have been in close collaboration with Ghana Health Services, World Health Organization, and other partners have engaged with public health working group in the country to share information. Uh, the government of Ghana has not made any request uh, of us, but we stand ready to assist however we can. So that's that answer there for you all. Uh, Will, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. I've got uh, two things. Um, it doesn't look, look like we'll be getting a, a climate emergency announcement this week. Uh, I want to make sure that's still on the table, uh, and I wanted to ask if the White House any, has any concerns that the President might be relying on uh, executive action too much. So the, to answer your first question, look, one thing that I just want to step back and just lay out uh, for all of you, when the President was w one of the first in Congress when he was a senator uh, to ring the bell, uh, the alarm bell on climate crisis. So this is an issue that has been uh, front of mind for him. This is an issue that has been, when it comes to the climate crisis, uh, a priority. And taking action is something that he said he will do if Congress won't. Uh, and he has been taking action, uh, as we have, uh, as I had just stated, uh, in, in my opening remarks, uh, since he's taken uh, since he taken office, uh, so he's going to take, as I said, additional climate actions in that vein tomorrow, uh, and he's going to continue. He's not going to just stop uh, with the actions of tomorrow. But I would not plan uh, a uh, a uh, announcement this week on national climate emergency. Again, everything is on the table. Uh, it's just not going to be uh, this week on that decision. On uh, uh, another matter, um, Senator Manchin is rejecting the, the global tax deal that Secretary Yellen uh, negotiated with like 100 plus countries. 
Um, what will happen if those countries move ahead with the deal and the U.S. doesn't? So I have a couple of things on, a couple of points on that uh, that I wanted to share with all of you. So we remain committed to finalizing a global minimum tax. It will level the playing field, as you all know, for U.S. businesses, uh, decrease incentives to move jobs offshore, and close loopholes that corporations have used to shift profits overseas, which will benefit American workers, businesses, taxpayers, and middle-class families. So that is critical and that is important uh, and why we need to do this. But this significant incentive for America to come into, it is uh, it's significant uh, for America to come into compliance. Right now, other countries are pursuing legislation uh, that would put them in compliance. If they act and America doesn't, uh, we'll lose out on tax, tax revenues that, that we could use to invest in the strength of our economy and the middle class. So it's too important for our economic strength and competitiveness to finalize this agreement. So we'll continue to work always to get it done. So that's going to be our focus as well. Go ahead, Ashley. Thank you. Uh, two related questions on climate. First, why did the White House decide that, that tomorrow was not the day to declare a climate emergency? I mean, what I can say is the president's going to do everything that he can uh, to take action. Again, climate, climate crisis, uh, taking climate uh, action is critical. It's important. You heard uh, Kirby talk about our national security, how it, how it threatens our national security, how it threatens uh, the economy. And what the president wants to continue to do is make sure that we're lowering uh, energy costs for the American family. E again, everything is on the table. Uh, I'm not going to go into private discussions, that policy discussions, or get ahead head uh, of the president uh, at this time. He's going to make some announcements today. What I can say, uh, this climate emergency is not going to happen tomorrow, uh, but we have, uh, we have, uh, we still have it on the table and uh, we'll, I don't have a circle, uh, a date circle on the calendar. When it does happen, can you talk a little bit about what specific tools it would then give the administration and what specifically you would use it for and do? So I, one thing that I just wanted to make clear, because some folks were asking um, about uh, about the abortion piece, the emergency abortion piece. So I just wanted to just lay out. Um, so look, we haven't ruled out a public health emergency as I just laid out. Uh, and so we're just, we're just still moving forward with, um, with the options that we potentially have uh, in front of us. Everything is on the table. But to declaring a public health emergency is very different from de declaring a climate emergency. Each unlocks a different set uh, of authorities and a different pot of funding. Uh, and so that's one way to, to think about that. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up because we've heard this. And so comparing one against the other as a reflection of priority would not be, uh, would not be accurate. Uh, but again, it's on the table. We haven't made, we haven't, we don't have anything to announce at this time. Uh, and, uh, you know, the president will speak more on what it is, how he wants to be. On those forward. differences, is it a, a bigger pot of money it unlocks? I know that was one of the concerns the administration had about the public health emergency. And are there any other specifics you can share about how you could use a climate declaration? So I don't have any specifics or anything to move further uh, on what I just stated. But you're right. When uh, Jen Klein was here just a, almost two weeks ago, she talked about how in the pot of money for for the uh, for the abortion pieces, there was just tens of thousands of dollars there. So we there was some feeling that uh, we, did, we didn't know exactly how that would work. But she did state that it would be still on the table and that we were still thinking through it. Uh, but uh, as far as the what's on the in the climate the climate side, I just don't have more information to share. Are there any downsides to declaring a climate national emergency? Um, right now, like I said, um, it's not on the table for this week. We're still considering it. I don't have the upside or the downsides of it. Uh, as you can imagine, and I have said, uh, this is an important priority when it comes to getting to clean energy, when it comes to dealing with uh, climate crisis, when it t comes to taking action. So the president is going to continue uh, to make sure he's doing everything that he can uh, to deal th of the threats of climate change. I just don't have specifics on the pros and the cons, but it is still on the table. When you talk about actions for tomorrow, um, should we assume that he'll, he'll be signing executive actions to announce tomorrow? 
Jeff, I just don't want to get ahead of the president. Uh, again, he's going to make some announcement. Call on this later to explain there, what he's doing. There, there might be. I just don't have one to announce. We normally do, to your point. We usually have background calls uh, when we're ready, and we usually invite all of you. Uh, I just don't have one to announce. There might be uh, in the next couple of hours. I just don't have anything to share. He's involved point. in these meetings today, or what exactly has he been doing yesterday and today? So he's been in meetings. I was, uh, I was called. I was scheduled to meet with him today. Uh, uh, in in the Oval Office. So he's been meeting with his senior staff. He's been meeting with uh, a staff. I think some of you may have seen him when uh, when the, the First Lady of Ukraine uh, was visiting with our First Lady. Uh, I believe you saw, uh, you saw him very briefly. Uh, so he's just been very busy uh, dealing with uh, the issues of the American people and meeting with his uh, staff and senior staff the last two days. Okay. Okay. Just a quick one uh, on climate emergency and public health emergency. How concerned is the White House it may land up sort of angering female voters if it does a sort of go ahead and announce a climate emergency ahead of a public health emergency considering we haven't seen uh, such an announcement after Roe? Is that is that why maybe the timing well, has been moved or no? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't look into I wouldn't make that uh, uh, into an issue. I th both, of, both of those things are still on the table. We just haven't uh, announced them or made a decision yet. Uh, you know, I just laid out what the difference, the difference is between uh, when you look at a, a public health emergency on the abortion side, when you look at a public health emergency, more so on the ab abortion side, but the difference between the two. Uh, we just don't, they're both on the table. We just don't, haven't made an announcement on that yet. Did say that he's asked his administration to see if he has the authority to declare a public health emergency. Is there sort of any update on into that work uh, to see if he has the authority ultimately to declare something like that? Again, we're looking at all options. <laughs> Everything's on the table. We just haven't made a decision on this yet. Thank you. He's great. Um, the mayors of New York City and D.C. are calling for more federal resources to assist with asylum seekers who are being bused to those cities from Texas and Arizona. They've had thousands of people arriving over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Mayor Bowser here in D.C. said that these people are being tricked. What federal resources is the White House preparing, if any, to deliver to these cities and other cities that are now dealing with an increase of asylum seekers? So I can tell you, Karen, that we have been in touch with both of their, uh, both of their administrations, both of their offices, and we're uh, going to continue to look into their requests. I just I don't have further than that to share, but we have been in touch with Mayor Bowser's office, and we have been in touch uh, with Mayor Adams' and office. Could be resources that can be given. Uh, right now, I can tell you that FEMA is the lead agency on this um, and so I, I would I would point you to them on uh, on any more information or details that they can provide and then on the other end of it some advocates say that the governors of these states are using these migrants have, as pawns has the White House reached out <coughs> to those governors and said don't send these people to these cities on the east so coast so as you know we're in constant communication and contact with governors uh, just across the country I don't have anything specific to that uh, you know, that the specific on uh, migrants being uh, shipped to other states. Is there a message from the White House about it, I think what it's, they I, should I do think we, we have, this has come up before, I believe, a couple of months ago, and I think we believe it's shameful uh, that, uh, that uh, some governors are using uh, migrants as a political tool, uh, as a political play, uh, when uh, we should be uh, making sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to, help, uh, to help folks who are coming into this process uh, uh, in a uh, legal way and making sure that uh, you know, we do this in a, in, a safe, uh, in a safe way and respectful way. And I think it's shameful that that is happening. Thanks, Corrine. Um, the Secret Service now says that they are unable to retrieve any more emails from agents from January 5th and 6th of last year. Does the President believe that it's acceptable for a law enforcement agency, a federal law enforcement agency, to simply lose such critical communications that are important to an investigation? So I appreciate the question. This is not something that I can speak about from here. Uh, this is something. This is a question that has to go to the. Any information or details has to go to the U.S. Uh, 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 Secret Service. I just can't speak from that from here because it's a. It is a active investigation. I understand, but this is something the Secret Service is saying publicly that they just, you know, they they didn't back up their emails uh, and texts properly. Apparently, um, and I'm just wondering. This is the agency that is tasked with protecting the president of the United States. Is he concerned about 
some, some gaps in admission there. I understand the question and I hear the question, but we just can't, I, I can't respond to it from here, from the podium. Okay, it's an active um, investigation. And, and then uh, has the president been, I know you mentioned Marburg's disease at the top, has the president been briefed on uh, the situation with Marburg's disease and is the White House preparing any additional action? Well, we're ready. We have not gotten, uh, as I stated, uh, any um, uh, um, any uh, ask for assistance, and we are ready to assist uh, when asked. I, I would have to check in with the team to see if the president's been briefed about this particular issue. Thanks. Can you say what role uh, ongoing reconciliation talks played in the climate decision? For instance, is a climate emergency off the table because you're worried it will upend the apple cart in the Senate? With Senator Manchin or, or, or others uh, by going sort of too big, too fast. Can you talk about what role the tensions that are between what to do now on climate and what you're still hoping to get out of Congress? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to what's happening on the Senate with reconciliation, I will not negotiate in public or speak to any private conversation. I can tell you that our teams are in regular contact uh, with Senator Manchin and other members uh, in the in the Senate and in Congress, just as we do on a on a constant in a constant way in a constant basis. Um, uh, I will say that, uh, as I mentioned, I wouldn't expect an announcement this week on the emergency. Uh, on the climate change emer emergency, uh, but what I will say is that it is still on the table. We have not made a decision yet. Uh, again, this is what we're seeing, uh, this action that we're going to hear about from the president tomorrow. This is part of uh, multiple actions that the president has already taken from the moment that he walked into office. This is urgent to him. He called uh, the climate crisis one of the four major crises uh, that he had to, that he was dealing with once walking into the administration. Uh, again, we're talking about national security. We're talking about lowering energy costs. We're talking about uh, threats to our economy. All of these things are critical. All of these things are important, uh, and he will be continue to be steadfast in focusing on, on uh, the climate crisis. And did he not do these things, the executive action, previously because he hoped that he would get it in legislation? Look, the president, and, and you've heard me say this, uh, you've heard him say this, of, when it comes to uh, the climate change provisions in reconciliation, of course, he wants to see it in the, rec in the, in the bill. Um, Question. Pardon me? Why not both? Like, why did he hold off? He seems to have held off doing executive action, waiting for the bill. Could he have not done Well, I think, walk? look, we, I, well, I think we could still walk and chew gum. No one says, uh, again, I'm not going to negotiate in public. Uh, uh, you know, the, the process in the Senate is, 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 is happening. I'm not going to speak to that in public. Uh, look, this is an opportunity. The president has said uh, that he was going to take action. Uh, he said, you know, he's always said if they, the Senate won't, he will take action. He is just taking another step. This is not the final step. Uh, this is part of a process uh, that he, uh, that you have seen him take, especially when it comes to the climate crisis. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I wouldn't see this as uh, an either or. I would see this as part of what he has been trying to continue to do when, in playing our part uh, in, the, in the climate crisis and dealing with climate change. And finally, can you offer any update on the deliberations on student loan relief and what kind of timeline, if any, there is on that? So I don't have a timeline for you. I know this is a question uh, that comes up often in the briefing room. Uh, this is uh, something that is clearly important to the president. Uh, and so as soon as we have anything to preview, we will make sure that happens. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Queen uh, Two on China. Um, China's warning that relations with the U.S. would be damaged if Speaker Pelosi visits Taiwan. Do you have any comment on the reports that she's going, and has the White House had any communication with her office about, about this? Report? So I, I, I'm just not going to comment on travel that the Speaker's office uh, itself has not announced, I believe. Uh, that's the last that I've heard before I came to the podium. So we'll refer you to the congressional delegation on their travel. Uh, I will reiterate that the United States remain committed to our One China policy, which is set forth in the Taiwan Relations Act, as you know, the three joint communiques and the Six uh, assurances. This has been a consistent U.S. position for decades across multiple uh, administrations. This is nothing new here. Uh, U.S. support for Taiwan remains rock solid, principled, and bipartisan, and is in line with our One China policy and longstanding U.S. commitments. But from what I understand, there has been no announcement, and I'm certainly not going to comment on her travels at and this time. Any update on when President Biden may speak or have a phone call with President Xi? And that's been yeah, as you know, they spoke recently, not too long ago. Uh, we 
and I've said this before, we are we are keeping uh, the lines of communication of dialogue open. There has been uh, staff to staff communications over the last several months since the last time uh, the president spoke to President Xi. I just I don't have anything uh, to preview on the next conversation. You're at your time. Do you want more? Oh yeah. Okay, um, I'll go around. Go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Uh, Corinne, um, a question on uh, on the Respect for Marriage Act. Uh, the president, after Dobbs said that he believed the, uh, the right to privacy was at risk, obviously you yesterday said that the administration supports this bill. Uh, we're seeing uh, some Republican lawmakers in the House come out in favor of it, uh, and McConnell says he won't uh, preview his vote. Um, on it until it reaches the Senate. So do you believe that Senate passage is actually in reach? And what is the president doing to get it closer to So as you know, and I said this yesterday, the, this is an, uh, an issue uh, when it comes to um, uh, the right to marry, loving who you uh, want to love. Uh, the president has been supportive of that for many, many years, uh, clearly before he was a president, and he has been very vocal. And so first I want to say that he strongly supports the bill, as you heard me say yesterday. He's grateful that this has bipartisan support in the House as we're seeing it. Right now there is a SAP, uh, a statement of administration policy that we sent out to show, continue to show uh, our support. Look, the president is always going to continue. Uh, to speak on um, on equal rights, especially as it relates it to this particular uh, piece on LGBTQ rights, uh, e uh, marriage equality. This is not something that uh, he uh, will not stop talking about. He will make sure he is uh, very clear. It's a priority for him, hence why we uh, did the SAP. Uh, but I do want to take a step back because I know that this has uh, bipartisan su support. You know, the exact reason for why this bill is being voted on is because of Republicans' assault on the recognition of Americans' right to privacy, uh, which has been recognized and upheld over decades by judges appointed uh, by a wide range of presidents that puts us here. That is why uh, the House, uh, you know, uh, uh, vote had to vote vote for this bill because, so that we, we can protect uh, people's rights because of what we have seen this past several weeks. The judges they've endorsed, for example, the state legis legislators they work with, they have said that the quiet part out loud, uh, which is they are coming for the right to marriage. Justice Thomas, as I have said many times before, right here in this briefing room, as the president has said explicitly in his concurring opinion, said this. He was very clear about this. Uh, so we need this legislation and urge uh, Congress to move as quickly as possible. And it's something the vast majority of country supports, of, of the country supports, just like they support restoring Roe, uh, which is a priority for the president, uh, stopping a national ban that we're seeing from the ultra MAGA uh, who wants to uh, make sure, who wants to make a national ban when it comes to uh, abortion. So we have to keep continue to, to speak out, uh, and the president's going to continue to urge for Congress to act. Okay. Just a follow up on that question. Is the White House speaking to Republicans about this bill, Senate Republicans about the bill, because we are starting to see even some of the Republicans in the Senate say they would be interested in passing the bill if they can. And so we support that. That is that is something that we are grateful to see. We are grateful to see. Look, we have multiple conversations with members in Congress, whether it's a Republican or Democrat. This is something our office uh, does pretty regularly, the Office of Legislative Affairs. Uh, I don't have anything specific to share on the different conversations on this. Uh, but certainly, uh, we are in constant touch with members of Congress and their staff. And what do you have to say to climate activists who feel like President Biden isn't being urgent enough? So, you know, 20 percent of the U.S. population, about 60 million people, are going to see temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit over the next few days. Um, they're constantly seeing how uh, the Supreme Court is taking some of the power away from the agencies to do that work. And they want to see President Biden do more and do quick and do it quickly. We talked about him possibly doing this uh, emergency declaration mm -hmm. um, and that not being on the table. Why not just do it if it is so urgent, as you guys said? So again, 
so he is going to take an action tomorrow, right? That's why we're going to Massachusetts. I'm not going to get ahead of the president. Hopefully we'll, we'll have a, a background call like we normally do uh, to share specifically what that looks like. Uh, so, you know, I would disagree uh, with the characterization of your question. The president has been uh, one of the first, again, first folks in member, uh, uh, amongst the members on the Hill when he was senator, to ring the bell, to ring the alarm bell on, uh, on climate a crisis. Uh, he has been, he has taken action. He has been, uh, you know, he has said when he walked in that the climate crisis was one of the crises, the four crises that he had to deal with. Uh, he has taken action to meet the goals, very, uh, uh, very uh, big goals, if you will, that he wants this country, our country to make in order to deal with uh, the climate, uh, climate uh, crisis. And he'll continue uh, to do that. And so, uh, again, this is one step, this is a continuing step of other steps that he has taken this past year, and we'll see more action from this president. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.